quarantine, everybody. Kids. Well, it's great to have you here, dude. I'm just trying to kill time. I don't know if I got some good stories. So. Which really is your career. Um, just trying to kill time. I, I'm one of those comics that when they tell you instead of doing 45 minutes, just do 30 tonight. I'm fucking ecstatic. I'm like, I know this shit barely works. Yeah. I don't need to keep doing it over and over again. Be cut my time, please. So ambition has never played a big role. A little bit. Field. Sometimes yeah. I feel like, but other times, like if you can get a half day at work, yeah. 45 minutes to 30, who wouldn't take that? <laughs> You're looking at your watch doing a 45 minute. Maybe like at 18, you start eating a sandwich. I keep a little buzzer in my pocket when I'm up on stage. It buzzes like 10 minutes before my set. Some nights I'm up there and I'm like, I can't wait. When I feel that buzz, it's almost like I came in my pants. I'm like, I can't fucking wait to get out of here. Has there ever been a night where you did both? No, I did get a blowjob once. <laughs> oh, not from the stage, but yeah. the girl said she would blow me. I said, right outside? She's like, yeah. And I went outside, and she blew me in the park a lot. <laughs> and I was hosting a show, and a guy brought up. He's like, I only have five minutes. Get it done quick. I go, do your act fucking eight times. <laughs> She's ugly. This might take a while. You know, I've done a uh, hundred of these interviews, and never before at my five-minute mark have I heard. So I'm getting a blowjob right off stage. <laughs> <laughs> but that's if you could look back from when you decided I want to do stand up and know this is where your career would be would you have thought that's more than you could want or less than you could want absolutely this is amazing where it's at you know at, when I started making a living doing it making like 300 bucks a week mm -hmm. just paying my bills I was like I made it to me I, I made it at that point <laughs> I love it and I yeah. just took little levels I made alright give me another goal yeah. another goal another goal but when I said I could do this shit for a living this is fucking awesome not have to right. cut lawns that's what I was doing <laughs> I was like the weed whacker guy it was brutal <laughs> And how was that? That was about the same money as you were getting for telling jokes. Was there was three hundred the amount? No, I was making like six hundred cutting lawns. <laughs> I took a pay cut, but it was worth it. Yeah. So, did as a kid, were you funny? Were you one of those guys that was a funny kid? Or? I was more quiet. Yeah, like the one liner, wise ass guy. Right. I wasn't like the guy putting a lampshade on his head at the party. Yeah. I was the guy sitting in the back just critiquing everybody <laughs> under my breath. Right. That was you. You were the guy. When someone says dance, no one gives a shit. You were the guy who did give a shit. Yeah, and exactly. Was judging. Yeah. <laughs> I was the guy in the back of the class just for making fun of the teacher, everyone laughing. Who said that? Not me. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So what made you think I could take this to the stage? I could do something with this. You know, I always wanted to be in a band. I was a big rock guy growing up. All my friends were in bands, but I just didn't have the talent for it. I tried. You know guitar, singing. It was funny because I'm a lefty, so all my yeah. friends were righties. Like, I can't turn the guitar around. I can't teach you. I, right. I couldn't find a lefty player. Yeah. Like Hendrix and Tony Iommi were the only lefties I knew. <laughs> Hendrix was dead, and Iommi lived in England, so like, I got no fucking shot. <laughs> um, and, but you know what? And When I saw Andrew Dice Clay and Kinnison, those two guys, right. bring like a rock star mentality to comedy, that's when I really decided that's what I wanted to do. Well, they were also, you know, they were both street guys. You know what I mean? They were street guys before they went up. And I always think, like, to me, the really funny people, they don't study comedy. You know what I mean? They're just funny people. You know? Yeah, I never studied. I mean, I like Pryor. I watched yeah. some of Carlin stuff. I was a big Rodney Dangerfield fan. I loved his one-liners and his movies. But I was never a big comedy geek. Mm -hmm. But when I saw them up there, I saw, when I saw Dice in a leather jacket telling dirty jokes, right. I'm like, this is <laughs> holy shit. It changed my life. Yeah. Sitting yeah. there, I was cutting lawns. I was drinking like two six-packs a night. A fucking alcoholic yeah. in a shitty apartment with two other friends. <laughs> Sleeping on a couch. You know, that's what we do. We get home from work. We had nothing else to do, so we just drink beer. And I saw Dice come on. First, I do him that seven minutes on Dangerfield. I'm like, holy. And then he did, like, a, three months later, did the hour uh, HBO comedy special. I'm like, yeah. that's it. That's what I want to do. Now, how quick did you get up? On it took me, like, two years. <laughs> right. Because I was petrified. I'm like, I, don't, I can't do this shit. Yeah. Because I'm funny around my friends, but that's a totally different thing. It is a different thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So, uh, it, maybe a year and a half it took me to get up, on, to get the balls to get up. I wrote a bunch of stuff. I was just afraid to go up there to perform it. 
Well, I, I remember when you did that piece, too, of like the, your early comedy notebook that you went back and, and did later, where you went back and looked at some of your material. How good of a writer were you up, right up front? I was horrendous. <laughs> I found my comedy notebooks from like 1992 when I first started, when I moved about two years ago, and I saw the jokes in there. I was, I was so embarrassed that they were in my house, I almost treated it like kitty porn. Like, I got to get this out before the cops come. The cops meeting Jim Norton, Rich Foss. <laughs> yeah. So, if there was anywhere that they, those guys could find those notebooks... Your life would have been hell. It would have been hell. But right. I was doing those jokes on stage, a lot of them. Right. And I was bombing. Right. But for some reason, like a guy like Rich Voss was already established when I started. Another, Bob Levy mm -hmm. was another guy that was established. And um, they took me and Norton on the road because they liked it. Well, I had long hair, so I would attract chicks after the show. This is like White Trash, New Jersey, <laughs> like 91. So Pennsylvania, Jersey. That, that David Coverdale, that David Coverdale look, Bon Jovi look, was right. killing yeah. at that time. So I would bomb on stage, but all these chicks would be talking to me afterwards. So Voss and Levy would just take me on a road because I would attract women, so maybe they could fuck them. <laughs> but they would always come over, like I'd have all these hot chicks talk after I just bombed, and Voss would come over, like, "Did you see his set? He's fucking terrible. Why are you talking to him? I just went up there and killed for an hour." <laughs> But it made me a better comic because it got me out there right. working. And also being with those guys, they kind of set something like a bar for you as well, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, Bob Levy as a nightclub comic, nobody can go on after that guy. That guy right. is so fucking funny. And just watching him every night up there, you know, you learn from it. Plus, it helped that he had a bad alcohol problem. Sure. Because his wife didn't want him drinking and driving, so me and Norton had cars. So she's like, all right, you're on every gig with him. So that fucking, we cut our teeth because of Levy's alcohol problem. <laughs> we were working like five nights a week. We were only doing comedy like a year because Levy had all these connections. I got to bring these guys. They suck, but they're going to drive me here. <laughs> so, you know, really for you, you saw Dice, you had a license, and you made show business. I had a license. <laughs> That was it. I lived like close enough to Levy to pick him up, and yeah. that was it. If Levy was just doing a little better and he could have a limo, you'd have no fucking I'd have career. no... No, absolutely. <laughs> and Voss was sober, so he didn't need a ride. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that was the early days, and you're just slugging them out at these places, right? The worst places. Yeah. Strip clubs. Levy, I remember we did this gig. It was connected to a strip club down in Philly, yeah. and there was two shows. So in between the shows, all the comics would hang out in the strip club, of course. Yeah. We'd want to get paid after that show, so we took all our money, went right to the strip club, and Levy whipped his dick out in the strip club. <laughs> and the bouncers came over to the comedy side, and they canceled the second show and sent us home. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I knew I better go out on my own. This right. is, this is, I, you know, I, I, I gotta, I can't be associated with right. this. I loved that he did that. Yeah. And it was hilarious, but. So really, you needed a license and then a jock strap for Levy. Yeah. And there's, there's a career. So, but just madness working those early, early gigs. Yeah, horrendous. Yeah. What's the worst gig ever? What's the worst room you've ever walked into? I remember there was a gig in South Jersey. It was in a bar. And me and Vinnie Brand go down there, a friend of mine. They book us in this bar. It's like a Tuesday night. We walk in. It's all bikers. <laughs> so like, oh, shit, this is going to be brutal. And then we're looking around. There's no stage anywhere. So we just go up to the bartender. He goes, all right, start the show in 10 minutes. I'm like, where's the stage? He goes, it's right there. And it was the pool table. <laughs> And it was bikers playing pool, so I'm like, like I'm not gonna stand on the pool table and tell jokes. They're playing right now. He goes, no, they'll stop in ten minutes. It's their last game. They'll stop. And then I'm like, yeah, but I'm not gonna stand on a pool table. I go, don't worry, we got it covered. And as soon as they were done with the uh, the game, two bikers came out with a big piece of plywood, put it on top of the pool table, and we stood on top of a pool table. Right. One of the bikers had to lift me up to get me on the stage. <laughs> And I told dick jokes for a half hour. Everything about this setup sounds like it was going to be a rape. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> it could have easily been. There was nothing in the area. No one had known nothing. It wasn't advertised a gig. Nobody even knew there was comedy there. <laughs> and then Norton would have taken it next week. You know, uh, I, do, I do that. 
That is with complete love. That, that joke. Of course. First of all, I got Norton his first paid gig. Uh-huh. I'm uh, emceeing at this uh, like rock club on Monday nights. I bring Norton in. He's a new comic. He says, I want to go up. Okay. He does these awful jokes about like raping his grandmother in church. <laughs> And there was like a local booker there. He's like, that fucking kid. Who was that kid? Get, don't bring, put him on your stage anymore. That's horrible what he said. And of course, I took a liking though right away. I'm like, this guy's a fucking a creep and a weirdo. And just said he could think of something so sick, I want to be friends with him. Yeah. And then like a month later, the same booker goes, I need someone to bring for you to open at this Holiday Inn or whatever in Jersey. I go, I got some guy. I didn't want to say his name because I knew he hated him. <laughs> I bring Norton with me, he sees him, he's like, come over here, he brings him in the room, because that fucking kid's a Nazi, he's not going on this stage. <laughs> I didn't think he recognized him, but he did, of course, and I go, no, he changed his jokes, he's all right, he doesn't do that yeah. grandmother fucking in a church anymore. And I just told Norton, I go, dude, take, cut that joke out, he's like, all right, man, and he did, and then he only had two minutes. <laughs> And see, here's the thing that always amazes me, is that to plenty of kids like today, you and Norton are the way that, that you guys looked at Dice. You know what I mean? Like, I know that there's young guys out there going, these guys are doing it. I can do it. You know? Yeah, I mean, me and Norton did it a different way. We didn't go through the city originally. We, you know, we worked right. our, we worked on our shit outside New York. Got a good forty five minutes down, so when we were ready to hit, we had the material to back it up. And you actually thought to yourself, someday I'll go into New York, but I'm not ready yet. Yeah, I went in early and got thrown out quick. Right. They wanted nothing to do with me. But I'm always amazed when some kid like in Iowa thinks I want to do comedy. I'll drive to L.A. and sign up at the comedy store, and they've never gotten up. And people do that all the time. Because once they see you once and you're not good, they won't see you for at sure. least three years. That's but, usually the, that's usually the rule of thumb, like three years. So don't go in too early when you. But everyone thinks they're ready. Everybody thinks they're sure. they, have, they you know they could do an HBO special in the first year because yeah. everything they write is amazing. But it's weird. Like no kid just thinks to himself, "I want to play baseball. I'll drive the Yankee Stadium. <laughs> right. I got a bat. I'll just go up and knock on the door." Yet they do that with comedy all the time. And, and my first big break, I got an MTV. Um, there was a, a comedy show called Kamikaze. Sure. So I got picked for that, right? Then the only reason I got picked for that is I went to a Caroline's Christmas party. And it was a comic named Rich Franchese that was around for a while and took a liking to me for some reason. So he introduces me to Don Jameson, who is one of my best friends now, that I didn't know he was working for MTV at the time, booking comics. So he goes over, he goes, I'm going to, because nobody wanted anything to do with me in New York. I couldn't get on stage. Everyone was like, who the fuck is that asshole with long hair? Get out of here. So um, he goes up to the, uh, Don James. He goes, and James, he goes, hey, uh, you should take a look at this guy. He, he's from New Jersey. He likes strippers and heavy metal. <laughs> and James is like, really? What's your name? We started talking. He goes, I'm going to come see you on Tuesday at the comic strip. We're looking for new guys. I go, okay. Tuesday came. I got the gig. So I got, and that's how I got on MTV by being a scumbag from New Jersey right. <laughs> that likes strippers and heavy metal. Yeah. Yeah. It's another beautiful New Jersey success story. It is. <laughs> Who would have known all those times, spending the time in a strip club would have paid off. We had something we could talk about. We went to the same strip clubs. We, you know, we, we yeah. bonded that night. Well, you know, when, before, you know, after you agreed finally to do this with me, I went back and listened to a lot of your prank calls. And some of this shit with you and Jameson... Even now, this many years later, it's so stupid and so <laughs> fucking funny. I, I listened seven times to I'm going to put my brother on. <laughs> and it's, I cannot to this day, I cannot understand why that's fucking funny. <laughs> and then as soon as it was done, I would put it back on again. <laughs> I don't know. I, exactly. I just said, let's just do something silly. I remember doing that call. I remember yeah. me and Jamie's like, All right, what's an idea? What do you want to do? And I'm like, you know what? Well, as soon as this woman asks for information or whatever, I'll just hand you. Hold on. I'm my brother on the phone. And then you pass it back to me at some point. And we only have one phone, so I don't even know what's going on at the other end. We're recording on a cassette with a friggin' 
It was so, yeah. And, and the first time, this is the only time we ever broke character because we were looking at each other and yeah. we started laughing halfway through. And we, then we started yelling at each other like a husband and wife. Don't fuck, you just fucking broke character. No, you did. You start, why'd you smirk? So the next time I go, if someone calls back, let's do it back to back. So we're actually back to back so we didn't look at each other, <laughs> handing the phone over each other's shoulders yeah. as we're doing that. And I could feel Jameson shaking his back like this because it was so silly. <laughs> So were you guys living together then? No, or, we weren't, no. No. <laughs> no, he would just come over. I'm like, hey, you doing anything? All right, let's just sit here and wait for the phone to ring. We had nothing going on. We had no yeah. girlfriends, no family, no life, nothing. Right. And it's hard to believe that's a fucking career move, you know? <laughs> I mean, it really I, is funny as shit. No, that, that actually made... I remember doing the first time I did that special ed uh, yeah. character. I remember because I was living with Jim Norton at the time. And, you know, he would come in at like 8 in the morning because he was out with prostitutes all night. <laughs> Which was one rule in the house. Don't bring any hookers in the apartment. Well, you were strict. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I didn't want to cock block him, but I'm like, look, I don't know. They might... I don't know. They might steal my Metallica records. I, you know, there's some Safe, rare ones I yeah. have. Safety first. Uh, so what? So what Norton used to do? He used to pull up in the driveway and then put one of those friggin' uh, white like uh, sun visor shields mm -hmm. in the in the in the in the windshield and get blown in the car because he knew like if you were on private property you couldn't get arrested by a cop with a prostitute in the car. He looked that up. <laughs> And it was the goofy one, like with the big sunglasses. It was one of those shitty ones. I hear him back up like three in the morning. I look out there. He'd be fumbling and putting it up. Oh, my God. He's yeah. getting blown again. That's unbelievable. So you guys were living together. We were living together. But so I, I remember uh, one of the calls called. And I said, let me just act like a retard. Right. And see if they'll stay on the phone. <laughs> so I just went, yay. I like it. Yay. Yay. <laughs> I know you're not supposed to say retard anymore. I uh, hope I don't get fired. Um, <laughs> no, I remember it was like a lemon. I the woman wanted like $25,000 from me to invest in something. I'm like, yeah, I got a lemonade stand. I just made like 50 cents. Uh, is that enough? And she stayed on the phone for like four minutes. I'm like, holy shit, I might be on to something. I'm like, yay, I like lemonade, yay. <laughs> and I remember Norton coming out of a room later in the day. He goes, dude, he goes, that yay thing is going to fucking sweep the nation. <laughs> and I'm like, no, nobody's going to like that. He goes, I'm telling you, I can't get out of my head. It's driving me nuts. And he was right. Yeah. And so he was just listening from the other room. Just listening to the other room. And you were, weren't doing it to even record, just to fuck around? or Just, just... to mess around. I wasn't even recording at this time. <laughs> I was just doing it to amuse myself. <laughs> and then uh, Jameson was the one who told me, he said, you should start recording this shit. It's pretty funny. Yeah. So then I started recording it. And then I, I, put, it out, I put a CD out of the, t the calls, and I just said, ah, I'll sell them after my show, I'll make 10 bucks, get my name out there, whatever. Mm -hmm. And Jameson knew Gary Delabate at the CERN show. So we, he goes, ah, I'm going to bring it up there. Maybe I'll play it on the air. So I went up there, and Gary's like, you know, all business. He goes, hey, how you doing? All right. He goes, all right, look, if it's funny, we'll play it on the air. All right, thanks. Goodbye. So I'm like, all right, nope. That's never going to happen. The next morning, of course, I wake up at like 11 o'clock in the morning as a comic. I'm not up to see if he might play it on the radio. And my fucking phone is blown up, voicemails, everything. He started, he's like, holy, he started playing, he played like four tracks off it. He's going, who the fuck is this guy? This shit is amazing. And that's how I got on the Stern Show, and then I got the crank anchor shit from that. All right, so when you first did this, you had no idea that you were, you were just selling it basically at my shows. At your shows. Make so, enough money for a lap dance, maybe. Yeah. Get my name out there. Yes. Now, did the people who were on the album know that they're on an album? Of course not. Okay. <laughs> Why would I tell them? <laughs> no, technically, with a telemarketer calls, if and it's an incoming call, if, as long as you beep out their name and company, you're pretty much safe because okay. they're calling you. So I made sure I did that. Right. You know, I was professional about it. <laughs> Very responsible. I tried doing it in the beginning, and they were like, ah, I don't care. Put me on. I'm quitting. This, this fucking job sucks. Anyway, I'll be out of here in a week. <laughs> they didn't give a shit, so. Yeah, that's true. That actually is true. They, they don't care that much. But some of those calls, they're so desperate to just try to get to that sale that no matter what the hell is going on, 
If you keep saying no, stay on the line, they're like, okay. If you don't curse or tell me you don't want the product, they right. can't hang up because they got a supervisor <laughs> listening. Right. So I knew that going in. So I'm yeah. like, no problem. I don't need to curse. And I'm just going to play like I'm a fucking idiot. Like, yeah. what is wrong with this guy? But he didn't tell me to fuck off. Don't ever call again. So I might have a live one on the line. <laughs> that was every... And it worked like a... I'm not, and my whole thing was, I'm just trying to get the information. I didn't know I'm not supposed to drown my grandfather in a tub. He won't shut up. So what am I supposed to do? Yeah. So at no point did anyone think I'm going to call the police or... It was just between... Oh, yeah. There was, there was a lot of cops called. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, that was yeah. Cops came to my house a couple times. One, I I said I was gonna, I killed this old woman, and well, I hit her with my car, and she's in the hospital. I'm gonna go smother with a pillow. Why don't you call back in an hour? And two detectives showed up at my door. Yeah. Going, you know what's and they said they come upstairs and they start looking in rooms. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, there could be a dead woman in there. We don't know. And I'm like, I'm, I'm a comic. I was just doing these prank calls. And they're like, look, just, just do it, but just stop with this. He's like, why? I'm like, I don't know, it's just fun. I go, all right, I, sorry, I went over the line. I go, you guys will never hear from me again. Don't worry about it. Two weeks later. And I don't know what, what I was thinking. I, I told my girlfriend at the time, I go, just pretend like you're screaming in the background. She's like, why? What are you going to do? I go, no, I didn't want to tell her because I knew she was going to say no. And I had my buddy Chuck there, right? So the woman calls, you're screaming, he's yelling. She's like, what's going on? Is everything okay? I go, yeah, my friend's just giving my girlfriend a home abortion. It'll be okay. <laughs> I had a vacuum going on in the background. <laughs> and she's thinking, uh, let me call back because you sound like you're busy. Oh, no, he's doing it. Don't worry about it. He's got, he's got a tool chest. He said he knows what he's doing. I'm just trying to save a few bucks around the holidays, you know? And she actually stays on the phone as this, this horrific thing is going on in the background. <laughs> Finally, she hangs up, but then I, I, I forget. And I leave the house. My girlfriend's like, you're a fucking asshole. You're going to hell. Why would you do that? I, we won't go to get coffee or whatever, me and my buddy Chuck. An hour later, I come back. My door is busted, it, busted down. <laughs> And I, all my neighbors are out front. I go, what happened? I go, the cops are here. They were looking for it. I go, for what? He goes, there was a 911 call. And I'm like, holy shit. They, the woman had my address in front of me once again. Right. I'm an idiot. I didn't even realize that they could trace it. So she thought there was abortion going on. Calls the local <laughs> cops in my town. They come to the door and no one's there. So they kicked in the door and fucking knocked it down to look upstairs, make sure nobody was bleeding. <laughs> so I go to the police station like an idiot. I go, let me just tell them it was just a joke. I walk in. It was the same two cops. <laughs> From two weeks ago, they go, what the fuck is wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know. I was, he goes, you don't think giving your girlfriend a home abortion, you don't think there's a problem with that? I'm like, I guess, I don't know. And then I'm just trying to be funny. I go, look, he's like, well, that woman left work. She was so upset. I go, look, I, I gave her a half a day of work. Look at the bright side. But I was face, actually facing six months in jail because of that call. Right. Yeah, I got a disorderly conduct ticket, like the worst kind. I guess, I don't know, there's different colors or some shit. Yeah. I had to get a lawyer and go to court in a packed courthouse, and the judge is reading the call. Like, you did a call where you pretended you're giving your girlfriend a home abortion <laughs> with a vacuum going on in the background, and her screaming, and you think that's funny? I'm biting my lip, the bottom of my lip. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. You're on Comedy Central? Is that what Comedy Central think is funny? The whole courtroom's fucking groaning at me. Like, what a piece of shit. Like, I just killed somebody. I got like a $500 fine, six months of community service, and then walked out as everybody was hissing at me. Right. And then when I got to the as soon as I got out the door, I'm like, that was fucking hilarious. Yeah. It I think maybe a better payoff is if you had to do the six months and then fucking explain to everybody else. Yeah. You're in there with rapists, murderers, one prank caller <laughs> in the middle of everybody. It's so yeah, you're right. crazy, man. That's so when Stern first plays it, it's the first time really people get to hear the shit that you've been doing for a while, right? Yeah. And how did that change everything that was going on with you? Well, that, that was right at the point where Jack and a Joke Man left the show. Mm -hmm. So they were starting to have unknown comics come in and sit in. There was guys like Dun Doug Stanhope, Fitzsimmons, Artie Lang, me, uh, Corolla, Kimmel. And um, I started sitting in and whatever. And next thing I know, I went from like doing shitty firehouses in Jersey to like doing improvs. Because he would just play. Well, no. <laughs> I went to Pittsburgh this time. <laughs> But just from him plugging the gigs. But what happened was, like, six months in, 
J- uh, Kimmel and Corolla were doing a man show at the time, and they had a. Uh, they were starting up crank anchors, and they were looking for guys who did prank calls, and they heard my shit on the Stern show. Got in touch with my manager, go, look, we want that guy on our show. They had no idea who I was. So this is... I was like the only unknown to get on that show, because they had some major stars on there. Tracy Morgan, Sarah Silverman, Attell, Dennis Leary, Chappelle, you know, so, so everybody was pretty much established at that point. But you were really on because they just loved some of these calls that they heard. They loved the characters, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, they loved the characters I was doing, the special edit, special edit. Oh, we're going to make a puppet out of this guy. I go, people are going to fucking hate this. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm doing a retarded guy. How are they going to like it? They go, no, no, they're going to love it. I'm like, all right, whatever. You guys take the heat. And that, that was one of those things that happens where, you know, that show runs on TV and a day or two later, all the kids in the country are doing that voice and getting in trouble in school for it. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're, yeah, and everyone's like, that's not funny. They're like, literally, we're yelling at kids what you're doing. You're, you're saying something a professional comedian says, and that is not funny. You must stop that. I remember my manager at the time was, was managing um, Greg Giraldo, too. And yeah. he's like, I don't know. He goes, two-year-olds laugh at your humor. I, why, should I, why should I manage you? I got, Greg's got a great career. He's doing Tonight Show every three weeks. He's a smart comic. And my two-year-old is laughing at your comedy. <laughs> it really did hit, you know, kids. It's odd. Yeah. I mean, a lot of your fans could have never come and see you. Absolutely. Because they were in bed already by the time the show started. Absolutely. And yeah. I'll tell you, um, well, when it hit, what happened was there was one publicity photo I took with the puppet when they had the premiere. <laughs> Standing next to the puppet. So now all of a sudden it's on the Internet. So the improv grabs that shot and puts it in front of their club and advertise on their website that I'm coming with a puppet. <laughs> so there's lines of fucking kids with their parents outside these improvs thinking I'm going to do a puppet show. And I'm up there, and if everyone's yelling and shit, like, all right, maybe a couple minutes will bring out the puppet. And I'm trying to, you know, there, it was almost like the Chappelle show with them yelling, Rick James, bitch. They're like, yay, I got mad. And I'm like, all right, all right, I get it, I get it. And then finally people are like, where's the puppet? Where's the? I go, there's no fucking puppet. <laughs> I remember a guy like 60 years old in the front. He's like, where's the puppet? I go, dude, you're a fucking 60-year-old man. You really need a puppet up here? I go, close your eyes and I'll do the voice. <laughs> but a lot of people were walking out of my shows because they really thought, I'm up there making fun of the homeless, basically, sure. like an opening bit. And people are like, oh, my God, I thought this was a puppet show. We want our money back. Right. So I probably lost like 30% of the crowd. <laughs> but the 70% that came, like, oh, man, this is funny. So they, they dug it. But I definitely took a hit. And the improvs are freaking out. I go, it's your fucking fault. Put a different picture up there. <laughs> I'm not doing a puppet show. I respect Otto and George, the great, late, great Otto yeah. and George. You know. A great friend of mine, but I was never into the puppets up. But Otto was just on another level where right. it didn't matter. He had that guy up, uh, George up there. It was fucking hilarious. Yeah. So, uh, but Eminem was the one who really put the show on the map. Eminem became a big fan of Crank Egg. Because the first season, nobody watched. It was almost got canceled. And Eminem found, uh, started watching the show and then went on the uh, MTV Movie Awards. And did, when he got his award, he did special ed the whole time. <laughs> He's like, yay! Boop, 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 yay! <laughs> You go, ladies, like doing like a, a obscure call, and the next day nobody knew what it was. Like an Entertainment Tonight, like what was Eminem doing up there? Was he like doing like something to his friend back in Detroit or something like that? And then we found out he was a fan. He called his manager, called like two days later. He goes, Eminem wants to be on that show, it's his favorite show, and he wants that guy to do special ed in Detroit in the studio in two days to do calls with him because that was the only show him and his daughter watched. <laughs> And his daughter was the one going, I want him, Dad, why don't you be on that show? So he's like, all right, I got to be on that show. <laughs> so I'm next thing I know, I'm in Detroit doing calls with fucking Eminem. It was unbelievable. <laughs> Which I almost didn't make it because I used to carry stink bombs on me on the road. <laughs> you know those glass tubes you step on sure. and they smell like rotten eggs? So we used to do, like me and Norton and guys on the road, we used to go to like the local dance club and drop them in the middle of the dance floor and just clear the dance floor. <laughs> We were like terrorists. We'd one be over there, one be over there. And like simultaneously, we'd drop them and just see people run for the hills. And it'd be on them the rest of the night. It'd smell like rotten eggs. It'd be on their shoe. It was fucking hilarious. Well, here's the thing, Jim. It's not like you were like terrorists. You were terrorists. That's, 
That's the shit that terrorists plan and do in a crowded room. I know. Believe me. I, you know, 9-11 ruined. I had to give up the stink bombs after that because you couldn't. But I did have one in my overnight bag going through security right after. This was like a three months after 9-11, I forgot they were in my overnight bag and the TSA found them. And they go, what is this? This is a controlled substance. You bring us on a plane? They brought me in a back room. There's like three cops, two TSA guys. They got my passport. The cop's like, okay, what are you going to do? What were you planning on doing with this? Why were you bringing us on a plane? They go, look, I'm a comedian and me and my friends, we dropped these stink bombs. <laughs> In these dance clubs when people are dancing and we ruin their good time, it's like, it's really funny. You got to see it. And the cop is just staring at me. With, and he looks at my passport. He's like, you're 33 years old. What the fuck is wrong with you? This, this is the thing about you two, Jim. You never try to lie your way out of it. You sit and tell yeah. them the truth. Yeah, I the figured, embarrassing I, I figured truth. he would find that funny. I'm like, that's yeah. not funny. How is that not funny? <laughs> Stink bombs were a big part of my life. But then, I, then he's like, well, you're not flying today. Like, they were freaking out. I go, look, I'm a, a comedian. I work on the show. Then I have to throw it out. I have to throw whatever. Like, I work on a show called Crank Anchors, and the cop's like, you work on Crank Anchors? What, what do you do? I go, I'm one of the characters. He goes, who? I go, uh, Special Ed. He's like, you're a Special Ed? I'm like, yeah. He's like, do it for me. I go, yay. He's like, get on the plane. Fucking go, go. Escorted me right to the front of the line. That was great. And this is why we still never feel safe in this country. Because <laughs> this... Is how easy it is to get through security, despite everything. Hey! Yeah, Yay yeah, got me in first class. So, how weird was it being with Eminem? I mean, uh, I you know, know, I was a big fan. I'm not a big rap guy, but I always yeah. liked Eminem because he writes from his heart. So it was weird. No, he does. No, he doesn't do. I got my bling. I'm in the club. Right. I, I got my bitches. I got my hoes. Right. You know, one song he writes about how much he hates his wife and he wants to kill her and chop her up and throw her off a cliff. And the next song he writes about how much he loves her. And anybody in a relationship can relate to both of those scenarios. So that's why I always like them. Yeah. But I remember walking in a room and, and I see him like in the studio part. I'm already in there and I see I see him like, all right, he's just a person. Just relax. He's just. All right, and, and he walks in, he's like, the first thing, he just looks at me, he's like, I can't believe I'm in the room with Special Ed. <laughs> that was the first thing he said. I'm like, likewise. Then we talked for like an hour, and we just made prank fall calls for like six hours. How Went to dinner afterwards and all the shit. And he used to, it was funny, because he, he had my cell phone, so he used to prank me as Special Ed. He, his name was Special M. I was Special Ed, he was Special M. But he would prank me like three times a week. And I knew how he did the voice, and I knew it was him. But I didn't want to, I didn't want to let it on because I want him to keep calling me. I'm like, who is this? That's fucking terrible. You're the worst. But I knew it was Eminem, man, because I knew the way he did. I'm like, fuck, he's calling my phone. This is awesome. That's so great. So at this point, are you thinking, I've made it. This is bigger than I could ever want. What's next? Yeah, I mean, we did the music awards like three months after that. We yeah. did a whole bit. You know, so stuff, yeah, I mean, the career just started taking off from there. Then I got on Inside the NFL on HBO. I was a big football fan. Which is insane. Yeah. You know, it's insane. And they weren't taking heat over the special ed character. It was like no one said, wait, the NFL has hooked up with the guy who does special ed. No, this was, luckily this was before the Janet Jackson thing, the Super Bowl halftime yeah. show. That's when everything turned this country. Right. Basically, so it was before. That was like 2005. I think that was 2006 when that happened, maybe, or yeah. I don't know, whatever it was. But it was before that, so it was flying under the radar to special ed stuff. So luckily, and they didn't really look into it. They just said, look, we want some edgy comic to come on here and fuck with the football players. <laughs> And I was a big damn Marino fan, so to work with Marino was fucking awesome. So what, what was the coolest stuff you got to do on that show? I actually got to go to Marino's house to do a bit. When Ricky Williams, I don't know if you guys remember, Ricky Williams quit football to go smoke pot with Lenny Kravitz. So, yeah, so I dressed up like Ricky Williams in the full dolphin uniform with the dreads and the shield and all that stuff and went to Marino's house with a bong and a football and knocked on his door, his actual house. I'm like, hey, Dan, I'm trying to get back on the, the dolphins. Uh, can you throw me some passes? No. And he's throwing me passes, and I got a bong in one hand, and I'm dropping him. He's like, Ricky, you got to put the fucking pipe down. And I, was actually, I pulled up in like a van with all smoke coming out like Cheech and Chong. But that actually got me fired. That was a huge bit, but... The high ups at HBO like, oh, my God, he's smoking pot. The NFL, they're a bunch of pussies. So I, I finished out the season and they got rid of me. But I was, I was happy I got to do that. But 
Also, because of that, you are an Emmy Award winner. Is that right? Yeah, I did yeah. win an Emmy for that, yeah. Emmy Award winner. As, <laughs> which is seriously an only an American moment that you think a year before you're getting in trouble over the abortion stuff, and then you're an Emmy Award winner. An Emmy Award winner, yeah. And I remember we had to go to the we had to go to the show, the award show. Me and Jameson just came from like a rock concert. Some band was playing downtown, and we didn't have suits. Someone calls like, "You got to wear suits." This is fucking. I'm like, "Oh!" So we went to like a men's warehouse on like 34th Street and just borrowed suits. We wore them, and then we fucking returned them the next day. I tucked the tags in on the side and brought it back. I love that you call that borrowing. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> So that was like, here's your Emmy. Now you're out. You're fine. Pretty much, yeah. They're like, yeah, yeah we want you to. We're not going to go with a comedian next year. We're just going to, yeah, we're not going to do those bits. A week later, Lewis Black gets a gig. <laughs> but I only got it because Wanda Sykes got her career oh, took yeah, off. Oh yeah, that's right. And I was friends with Wanda, and I was really excited for her. But she got so busy, she had to give up the gig. So I got the gig because she got yeah. busy. So. And then I know you and Jameson started to film some of the pranks, right? You were shooting that. Yeah, so. we did. We did a hidden camera series called "Meet the Creeps." Yeah, which Where? is really to me. That's one of the funniest titles I've ever heard in my life. It's perfect, right? Yeah, We're just a bunch a of fucking creeps. <laughs> it was me, Norton. Yeah, Norton was in a club soda, Kenny. So it was just <laughs> just a bunch of fucking slobs, just fucking with people. Yeah, and Comedy Central actually, we, they had a broadband channel on the internet. They were starting, mm -hmm. so our show was on there. We started from there, and then they said. You know, maybe you'll make the TV, maybe you'll actually make Comedy Central. And we did a pilot for Comedy Central, but it didn't get picked up. They said the shit was too mean. <laughs> what, what, what actually offended them a little bit? What did they think? Well, we mean? did this one bit. There was an abortion clinic near my house. <laughs> Again, with the abortion. Yeah. And every, it's a theme. <laughs> Meanwhile, I never got a chick pregnant where I, I had to get an abortion, so I don't know where this is coming from. Hold on, I'm listening. I always had good timing. Yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, timing. Okay. Yeah, timing. <laughs> I never got drunk enough where I was like, yeah. oh, fuck, that might have been a little late. Yeah. <laughs> well, they say, that, they say that timing is the most important thing in comedy. It is. And, you know, pulling. <laughs> um so they thought it was too creepy. The yeah, the too creep. much. Yeah, there was yeah. A, well. So every Saturday, these protesters would be outside the abortion clinic. <laughs> so I was like, "Oh, this is perfect." So I pulled up there. We pulled up their hidden camera. Had a girl in the car. She had a pillow on the shirt, like she's pregnant. So we pull up right in front of the protesters. She gets out. I get out. I'm like, "Get in there!" She's like, "No, I want to keep my baby." <laughs> I'm like, get the fuck in there now. <laughs> then she starts running away, and I chase her with a coat hanger. <laughs> and for some goddamn reason, the suits at Comedy Central <laughs> failed to see how marketable that idea was. They told us, go to the next level. Go way out there. There's... There's no line. I go, really? There's no line? No line. All right. But obviously there was. Yeah, there's a line. You know what would have been great would be to have a camera on those executives when they watch that shit the first time. Yeah, like, what are we doing with this? Yeah. We just, uh, yeah. How do we get out of this? Yeah. Uh, and then, like, here's what I, I think is so great about your career. Number one, you didn't seem like you pushed it or had this plan, and you keep going from one gig to the next, and, you know... But then you end up, after all this, doing something that you really love, being involved in heavy metal, which is just crazy and unexplainable. My, you... my whole childhood was basically making prank calls because I was always grounded. <laughs> so I had nothing else to do, so I'd just pick up the phone and fuck with people. Yeah. I remember one of the first ones I did, me and my buddy Tony, I don't know, he was upstairs and I was downstairs and we're just calling and as soon as a woman would answer, like, how big are your tits? <laughs> That's what we came up yeah, with. Right. I don't know, we thought that was funny. Yeah. So I'm downstairs and I'm doing a dial and he's upstairs so I see mom's work number and we're at his house. So I call the work number and his mom was a secretary. So she picks up, she's like, hello? He's like, how big are your tits? She's like, Tony? Is this Tony? <laughs> He fucking hung the phone yeah. up, chased me down a block. <laughs> but I remember I was like, so I did that my whole childhood, and I listened to heavy metal because my older brothers were into it. 
So me and Jameson are doing comedy. We're driving back from these road gigs. And we hear Eddie Trunk on the radio every Friday night doing a heavy metal show right here in New York. And we're like, man, we never met him before. We didn't know who he was. Like, man, this guy likes the same shit we do. Holy shit, this is weird. How do we not know this guy? We meet him at a concert. We're like, hey, we're comics. He goes, oh, come up my show. Sit in if you guys know metal. We sat in and then Eddie's like, hey, man, I'm going to pitch this show. We're going to just do a talk show for VH1. He had a connection there. And uh, they brought us in. And next thing you know, we did a pilot with like Lita Ford. We're like, all right, this is... <laughs> You know, I'm like, Lita was out of the business for like 17 years. Yeah. She was living on an island. She married like a billionaire, raising two kids. And her first comeback was our show. And like, we did one episode and people loved it. And they were like, all right, we're doing it. And now that was six years ago, 130 episodes. And we're That's still going strong. Unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. Yeah. And see, that's the weird thing about show business. Here's one show that you're pushing, you're pimping, you're trying to make it work, and the next show you just kind of fall into, and that's the one that sticks, you know? You never know. Even the Crank Anchors thing. Even when they told me that, that, that my manager calls, they go, hey, they want you on the show, Crank Anchors. What you're going to do is you're going to make prank phone calls, and they're going to recreate them with puppets. I'm like... That's the fucking worst thing I've ever heard. I'm like, nobody's going to like that. Yeah. He's like, yeah, well, Kim and Carolla are guaranteed six episodes. So the only thing I'm thinking is Norton, Voss, the late, great Patrice O'Neill, Keith Robinson. <laughs> Keith Robinson, those four guys are going to fucking bust my balls that I'm doing a puppet show. Right. That's all I'm thinking. I don't even care that it's a TV show on Comedy Central. These guys are going to give me shit and then it just took off from there. So what the fuck do I know? So, yeah. And then the next one that you fall into with Eddie, there is a chemistry on that show that really shouldn't even belong there. It's one guy does not look like he should be with the other two. And he's the actual music guy. And for some reason, that show just really works. It's, it's a really great, fun, positive... Eddie was musical. working up there at VH1 yeah. for a while, and they just said, all right, if you're going to do this show, we want two guys that are going to bust your balls. Is that right? Yeah. They wanted that, yeah. And Eddie's like, I got the two perfect guys. <laughs> and I showed them our Meet the Creep stuff. Like, all right, these guys are fucking assholes. Right. We want them. But because of that, you kind of learned to become an interviewer, too. I mean, you, when you and Jameson are on that show, you, don't, you rarely go for the joke. You're m more talking about music, and then the joke comes in about each other. But I never see you guys really pound any of the acts or anybody. That comes no, because I know if we got, like, Steve Harris from Iron Maiden was yeah. on our show. That guy doesn't do any press. Yeah. But luckily, he was in the States and at the time in California at a solo album. He was, I'm, I'm thinking, if I'm at home, I don't want some fucking comic on there cracking <laughs> one-liners. I want to know what Steve Harris thinks right. about the old singer, what's going on now. I'm like, shut the fuck up, dude. I get it. You're funny. That's the way I look at it when I'm doing right. these interviews. All right, people know I'm a comic, but... You know, we got a Brian Johnson, Macy DC on there. Let him tell stories. Yeah. I don't need to jump in. I don't need, you know, I don't have that much of an ego where I got to go, no, look at me, look at me. He's yeah. the singer ACDC. We're going to look at him. Well, that's the beauty of that. No matter what happens, you're there again the next week because you're not making it about you. You guys are making it about the music. And it's on VH1 Classic just all the time, you know? It's, it's great because if that show was on NBC, it would be shown once and then maybe one other time, repeats in the summer. Right. VH1 Classic had no other program besides... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Besides, like, fucking, you know, rescue dogs for, like, 45 minute commercial. Yeah. They got the Ginsu knife or some shit that I think they're still showing. They got, so they show pop up video from, what, 1991? Right. So they just show our show over and over again. So it's yeah. great. It's constantly on. So it helps us with the exposure. Well, it is. It's terrific. And you're working with Eddie, who was one of these guys. And he was like the first guy I met when I came to New York. And he always thinks that the plane is going to crash. No matter. <laughs> he is like, you know, it, it, there's some people like glasses half full. Eddie's like, it's half you know, empty but filled with piss anyway. <laughs> but I'm still drinking it. Why I bitch about it? He always thinks everything is going wrong, and here you and Jameson seem to be much lighter about the whole. Yeah, thing. he definitely um, yeah. has that attitude. But yeah. you know, I, I'm hanging around other comics with low self-esteem and everything else. I'm used to it. Yeah. Them bitching out. This is gonna suck. I'm, I'm, I'm worthless. All this other stuff. So I'm you. So I just try to calm down. I'm like Eddie. Look, we got a fucking show on TV. Who gives a shit? If they're going to bu bug us about something, who, can't who gives a fuck? Right. So I try to calm him down like that with that. But yeah, he, you know, 
He gets he he's very high strung. He is, <laughs> but one of the nicest guys. He's, seriously, without a doubt. I mean, he is about the best person that you can meet. But he's always sure everything's going to just fall into the earth, and there's nothing you can do about it. He's just wowsy wowsy woo woo every fucking day. It's amazing. And then you and Jameson looks like you just don't give a shit about anything. No, I don't. Uh, really, Set could be on fire. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, care. whatever. You know, fucking, who cares? Yeah. We're getting a paycheck. We're on TV. And I got guys in Iron Maiden shirts showing up in my comedy shows. I'm fucking good. <laughs> what's, uh, what's the most fun you've had on that show? Like, what people that you come on that, like, the 14-year-old Jim Floridine <clears throat> would flip out for? Um, I, you know, all the guys from Sabbath, except for Ozzy, have been on, yeah. which has been great. Yeah. But then, like, Lars from Metallica has been on, and Kirk Hammett's been on from Metallica. I'm huge fans of them. Yeah. You know, I knew those guys. I grew up in Old Bridge, New Jersey, and the guy that discovered them basically was in Old Bridge, had a record label, and as a little kid, before their first album came out, I used to drive them around mm -hmm. Metallica because they were staying there. Because they didn't have a car and they were staying at the record company's guy's house. Like, look, these guys are alcoholics. They haven't showered in three weeks. Can you just take them to the movie? So I'm fucking driving around with Metallica. I didn't, you know, they, they, didn't, have, they didn't even have an album out yet. Yeah. So I, but they didn't remember that, of course. Like, I don't know, fuck it. I brought it up. They're like, what? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wasn't going to force the issue, but then when, after the show, we tape a show, and Lars goes, hey, I'm going to go out drinking. You want you guys want to go? What are you guys doing tonight? We're like, uh, yeah, I got a couple things going on, but I'll, I'll meet you. So just yeah. fucking go and drink it with Lars and talk music. But that's, and those guys look at you that way now. I mean, people, you're invited to all, shows everywhere. Yeah, and, and then they had their own festival, Ryan Fest, yeah. down in Atlantic City, where they had a comedy tent. So, you know, and they picked me and Jameson and Jim Brewer, and surely, as the four comics go up and perform, so we basically Lars introduced me on stage. That's crazy. so I basically opened for Metallica. Technically, <laughs> they were on the bigger stage, but I was still there on the same day. You know, the heavy metal audience normally isn't thought of as a comedy audience. <laughs> what, do, what do they like to work in front of? They were actually good. I was surprised because we had to do like a half hour. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, how am I going to do a half hour in front of these people? They stood, you know, standing too. You don't want com You don't want people standing when you're doing comedy. <laughs> yeah, right. That's the worst. They're miserable. It's hot. It was in July in Atlantic City in a friggin' airfield. Yeah. Old shitty airfields, 100 degrees. But they were amazing. An amazing right? crowd. Yeah. That's but I've great. done a lot of shitty gigs opening for bands too. Like, what was the worst for you? I've, I went on tour with Slayer, Slayer, Megadeth, and Anthrax. <laughs> For a month <laughs> on a tour bus, yeah. and it was brutal. Yeah. I loved it. I was the cha it was a challenge, but I'm doing arenas, you know, trying to do comedy in front of Slayer fans. You'd, it's 99% angry white males <laughs> that like Slayer. Yeah. And really, at that point, you're thinking to yourself, "I wish I was back on top of that pool table." You know. <laughs> Because that is, that is the thing about stand-up, is a bad gig still hurts, no matter how much experience that you have. Absolutely, you know? yeah, because yeah. they didn't know I was coming out. Most of the people knew me in the crowd, but they didn't give a shit. <laughs> I had to do, I, what, the thing was, I had to do three five-minute sets. So the first set, you know, the venue's half full, so I can get away with it. Second one, uh, questionable. But the third one, they, they're like, all right, dude. I'm like, hey, because they're, they're all chanting, Slayer, Slayer, you know, thinking they're going to come out. Right. Check one, two, check one, two, guitar. All right. Dude. And what, what happened was the third set, I couldn't be on the main stage because Slayer had this big stage show where the curtain was covering the whole stage. So I had to go back to the soundboard in the middle of the venue and do my set from there. <laughs> So now you picture like this 14,000 Slayer fans. They're facing the stage. They think they're coming on Chant Slayer. All of a sudden, the spotlight hits me. <laughs> hey, how you guys doing? I'm over here now. <laughs> and they're like, fuck you, dude. Enough. <laughs> All right, we get it. You're a comic. Relax. <laughs> That is so fucking and, brutal. And, yeah, and the first night, I, I'm in San Antonio. There's beers getting thrown at me. I, I see these missiles coming at me. I'm like, I'm dodging them as I'm trying to tell dick jokes. But they're splashing on a soundboard and shit yeah. like that. And they're like, what the fuck? You can't, just going to short out the board. The next night, they put like five minutes before, they put a tarp down. <laughs> like a tsunami was humming. All the family members, get away. He's going on stage. They just left me hanging by myself. You, you motherfuckers. It's show business. It's so exciting. <laughs> It's so exciting. And you're also doing acting now. I saw you in Californication this year. What else, what else have you been on? 
Uh, Amy Schumer show. Amy, Amy Sh Schumer Inside show. Inside Amy Schumer. Oh, that, that show is truly so funny, so well written, so performed that I don't even think people have caught up. Like They're like, oh, Amy's funny. But the truth is that whole damn show is so well done, man. It's, it's really strong. It's a, it, it, yeah, she's been, a, she's been, you know, really helped my career a lot by having me on the show. You know, she put uh -huh. me on a, a, a sketch the first season. And um, from that, I got the Californication gig. Is that right? Yeah, because they, they, you know, they want to see that you did something besides like a little fucking shitty independent film that your friend did. You know, <laughs> oh, I got this clip. I did my college guy. He knows yeah. what I am. Yeah, and I, I did Beer League, but it wasn't a good clip. I was in Artie Lang's Beer I was the catcher, with, with, but I had my mask on, so right. you just hear my voice. So that wasn't a good clip to show, but the Amy Schumer show got me to Californication. It also got me on Girls, too, because Judd Apatow knew me from, yeah. from Amy's show, so I got a part on that this season, too. So she's been amazing for my career, you know, and she's, she's great. She's great to comics. Too, you know what I yeah, mean? She yeah. really takes care of them. She respects the older comics, the guys that have been around for a while. She's not this new and upcoming, you know, comic. They go, oh, fuck those old guys. You right. know, we're, we're, I'm the new new person. So, well, when you you just look at your work in abortion jokes alone, <laughs> the legacy stands, Jim. See, of course she's right. going to respect. Yeah, maybe that's what it. Is. Yeah, she me me Norton and Bobby Kelly. She, yeah. you know, she's like I I got scumbag friends. I like that. <laughs> yeah. But that is, I mean, it's really well done. The show is really, really well done, really well, well written, well performed. It's uh, terrific. Then Californication, they brought you in the kind of glare at the star for a half an hour, which was great. Because you look like, this is the thing about you, you look like you're going to beat someone up all the, yeah. all the time. But you're, you're not kind of a fighter. You're not, that's not your I've been in a fight since sophomore year in high school. Yeah. But yeah, I do. Yeah, I walk around. It's better to walk around like that. Because then people are like, I don't know what the fuck's wrong. What's wrong with him? My wife says the same thing. Not that I'm going to beat her up. But she's like, why are you so angry? I'm like, because you're here? I <laughs> that was a joke. Yeah. Now, you're happily, very happily married. Yeah. yeah. But I've heard you talk about this before. You would always be attracted to girls that were somewhat troubled you know yeah. that was that was your thing or? that was my thing yeah well what, what what was where did that come i from? think i got that from my mom my mom was real religious mm -hmm. raised seven kids but always take people in like off the street they'd be living in a house like, i feel bad for them right you know what i mean any relatives oh just move in here you know and like there was like 20 people in our house at some points yeah it's like no you got to take care of people they, they, you know there's something wrong with them taking so i think i got that from my mom growing up that i felt bad for these troubled women so i always wound up dating them that was and that's why and that's why i'm friends with a guy like a jim norton and a rich boss <laughs> Troubled men. I got attracted to that. As soon as yeah. I heard Jim Norton say, I'm fucking my grandmother in church, I'm like, I want to be best friends with this guy. Yeah. There's something wrong with him. You know, when you get sober at 18, you got fucking problems. <laughs> you know. You know. He, has, he hasn't had a beer since he's 18. <laughs> That's fucking, there's something wrong with that. Yeah. Um, that is true that maybe he should think, let me just sit at a bar once. Maybe now I can do it. You know, you don't know. He wasn't even old enough at the point. No, he wasn't. Yeah. He did the first. I, I got on my first road gig, Jim Norton, too. We drove to like Connecticut, me, him, and Bob Levy. I just bought this brand new car. Norton meets this girl at the show. She wanted nothing to do with him. He thought she did. She felt. She goes, "Here, here's my number." So he's all excited. I can't believe I got her number. On the way home, he's sitting in the back seat. I'm driving, and I hear this noise in the back seat. I turn my interior light on. He's jerking off in my back seat with his dick out, like going like this. I go, "Dude, what are you doing?" He's like, oh, I, "I can't wait till I get home." That chick got me all horny. I go, I just bought this car. Still had the new car smell. I'm like, dude, I just fucking... He's like, don't worry, I got my T-shirt. He had his T-shirt off. And he's like, oh, don't worry, if it goes anywhere, it's going to go right into my shirt. It's not going to get on anybody. And I'm arguing with him as he's jerking off. He didn't even stop. He's like, dude, come on, I can't... I, come on, I got to... I can't wait, I can't wait. And I had to actually pull over. I go, dude, seriously, put your dick back in your pants. <laughs> well, how could you not be best friends with that guy? That's when I should have ended it. <laughs> uh, and you got, you were just telling me about this. It looks like you're going to be forming your first stand up special. Yeah, my first, yeah, I'm filming my first special September 13th. Yeah, that's great. 
And, um, George Street Playhouse in uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Tickets just went on sale tonight, today. It's, so. it's fantastic, man. It's weird because it's my first one because there was a, I was close a bunch of times when Crank Anchors was hot. They're like, all right, we're going to do an hour special with you because, you know, you're on, you know, Crank Anchors and the show's really big. But then it gets canceled and then they don't return your calls. Yeah. Yeah, then they want nothing to do with you. Then I get the hidden camera show and they go, okay, as soon as it gets on the air, we did the pilot. We're going to do the special with you. That gets canceled. And then they were ready to do it, and then all of a sudden, um, Jim Norton was doing his HBO Down and Dirty show, and they picked me to do the show. I was like the first comic they picked. They go, look, you know, don't go to Comedy Central and, you know, go do stuff with them. I go, fuck them. They made me wait, and they fucking pull, pulling shit on me. I'm doing HBO. So Comedy Central's like, look, we're ready to give it to them. I'm like, fuck you. I'm doing HBO with my buddy Jim Norton. So, so, but th so we'll see where this one goes. You'll see where it goes. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this. Stand-up comic, radio host, TV host, actor, getting his first special, and really one of the real, real good guys. So glad to have you here tonight. Right here. In New York City, at the stand, Jim Florentine. Thank you. Thank you so much.